15. This story begins on the night of December the 7th, 1811. It was a Saturday night, and Timothy Marr, the proprietor of this shop here, Marr's Silk and... Can you see it up there? Silk Drapery was closing up for the night, it was midnight, he was closing up after the busiest shopping day of the year, and he sent his servant, Mary Jewell, out to buy some oysters for supper. Mary left the house with her bonnet and tippet and went down the road, came back 20 minutes later, empty-handed. She found... Oh, I better turn this off. <laughs> she found... She found the shop completely dark. She'd left it with blazing lights like his. She came back, she found it completely dark. Slightly confused, she knocked on the door, got no response at all. Knocked again, no response. Started knocking with increasing levels of panic. Still no response. She put her ear against the door and heard soft footsteps on the stairs. She called the attention of the night watchman, who's walking up and down the road calling the hour. He knocked, no response. They woke the man next door, who ran a pawn shop, and he broke into the back door of the house, where he discovered to his horror that Timothy Marr, plus his wife, plus their assistant, plus their six-month-old baby, had been bludgeoned to death and had their throats cut. The murderer had escaped through the back window into the wastes at the back of the building. There was no evident motive for this crime. Timothy Marr was 30 years old. He'd been a sailor. He had no friends. I mean, <laughs> he had no enemies. <laughs> Slip there. He had no known enemies. Um, and nothing was stolen. Nothing was stolen. And so it was completely mystifying who would have done this thing. London was paralysed with fear. There was a serial, like, there was a killer on the loose. Nobody knew when he was going to strike again. He struck again 12 nights later. Oh, hang on. Oh. Yeah, 12 nights later in a pub around the corner from the Ratcliffe Highway. We're talking now about, um, about Wapping, the East End of London, Wapping. In a pub, five minutes, less than five minutes, around the corner, called the King's Arms. The proprietor of the pub, a man called John Williamson, had just closed up for the night. He was just locking up. He lived there with his wife and his granddaughter and their servant. When the murderer struck again, came through the front door, bludgeoned them all to death, and cut their throats. He was seen by the lodger, who was in, the, who was in his bedroom, which is in the top, the top window there, the top window on the, um, on the left, who came tiptoeing downstairs and saw the murderer, a very tall man in a long white coat, just going through the pockets of one of his victims to see what he could steal. The lodger, absolutely terrified, belted up to his room, shoved, a, be uh, shoved a, um, a chest of drawers against the door, and then made his escape. Because he could hear the footsteps, again it was footsteps, he could hear the footsteps of the murderer coming up the stairs. He, he tied his bed sheets together and um, lowered himself out, calling, murder, murder. This is one of the pictures that was in the, um, in the, um, the papers two days later. Called the alarm. The front door was sort of broken into. The murderer had again escaped through the back window across the wasteland down to, down to the river. After a week of intensive interviewing by, the, um, by the, uh, what stood then as the police force, a man called John Williams was arrested for the murders. There was scant evidence, really, and I think it's pretty likely that he, that he wasn't the murderer. He was arrested and imprisoned, and on, um, on the last night of the year, on December the 31st, 1811, he hanged himself 
in his cell. And his body was then, he was, he was, it was assumed that he was guilty, he was hanging himself through, um, through guilt. His body was then in this bizarre pageant paraded through London on this, um, on this strange kind of coffin-like, hearse-like and con um, con contraption here, and which paused outside Mars Sharp and the King's Arms, where his broken head was turned round to look at the, look at the place where he apparently did, did these crimes. Everyone was pleased and relieved that, that, that the murderer was dead, apparent murderer was dead. Now, following this story, 300 miles north, was a young man called Thomas de Quincey. He was living in this house here, which I'm sure many people have visited, one of the most fetishised houses in English literature. It's Dove Cottage, Wordsworth's former home, which Thomas de Quincey had taken over a couple of years before the Ratcliffe Highway murders. So, I'll give you some numbers. Thomas de Quincey was 27 years old. He was 4 foot 11. He'd been a fan of Wordsworth since he was 14, an obsessive fan of Wordsworth's since he was 14. He was a demented fan. He was Wordsworth's stalker. If you like. That's how he'd ended up living in his house. In 10 years' time, he'd become famous. He would become famous for writing Confessions of an English Opium Eater, the first misery memoir in the language, the first recovery memoir in the language. But right now, he's never written a thing. He's living in this, well, in this shrine to Wordsworth's genius, if you like. It was in Dove Cottage that Wordsworth wrote what is generally agreed to be his finest poetry, including the Daffodils poem. And De Quincey settled down here to turn it into an opium den. He's, um, and this was the reason I decided to write this book about De Quincey. I always thought it was very, very funny that De Quincey, De Quincey turned his hero's house into an opium den because Wordsworth was so disapproving of it. Anyway, so here was De Quincey living in this absolutely divine little cottage thinking about murder. De Quincey was obsessed with murder. He had three obsessions. Wordsworth, opium, and murder. And these, um, the Ratcliffe Highway murders took over his life. He wrote about them again and again and again and again. He wrote about them in various forms for 50 years. There he is. I'll just turn you. What fascinated him about them wasn't, it was nothing to do with sympathy for the victim or any kind of regard for the policeman who arrested him. It was the murderer himself. He liked crawling his way into the mind of the murderer. He thought that, uh, he thought that the murderer was an artist. And the essay that he wrote about John Williams was called On Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts. And it's a brilliant piece of irony. It's also a piece of writing that anticipated our own age with its own obsession with, mu with murder as a fine art. Now, De Quincey's argument was quite, it's quite simple. There's more to a good murder than two blockheads, as he put it, one to kill and another, be, and another to be killed. For a good murder, you need to have lighting, design, <laughs> setting, atmosphere, perfect timing, the costumes have to be right. He said you can evaluate a murder in the same way that you evaluate any work of art. But really, he was talking about evaluating murder in the same way that you'd evaluate a poem. Now, what kind of frame of mind was De Quincey in when he was thinking about murder while living in his hero's cottage? He was a disappointed man. 
You know, he'd spent years pursuing Wordsworth, idolizing Wordsworth. He saw himself as the cause of Wordsworth's fame. No one, he said, would have heard of Wordsworth had it not been for De Quincey's promotion of him, had it not been for Quincey's brilliant understanding of what Wordsworth's impenetrably difficult poetry and lyrical ballads was about. Wordsworth would still be completely, he'd be the butt of everyone's jokes, he'd be ridiculed. But De Quincey understood Wordsworth, and he wasn't getting sufficient acknowledgement from Wordsworth for the work he'd done promoting him. So De Quincey felt that he was living in Wordsworth's cottage, not as an equal, not as a friend of Wordsworth, not as, um, not as a, a fellow fine mind, but as a custodian of the Wordsworth Museum, a custodian of Wordsworth's genius. And De Quincey, De Quincey was obsessed with houses. He was a house tourist. He always lived in the houses of the, um, houses of the people he idolised. And he was obsessed with the houses in which the crimes took place on the Ratcliffe Highway. For De Quincey, uh, it, was so, it was much more thrilling to have your throat cut in a house than to have your throat cut on an open road. It was, he saw all houses as crime scenes, all families as as crime scenes, and it was certainly a crime scene that he was living in here, in Wordsworth's house. All he could think about was <laughs> the, crimes he'd like to, um, the crimes he'd like to commit. Now, he found his way inside the murderer's mind, and he said what he saw there was a man who was, who was driven by, uh, by jealousy, ambition, rage, power, genius, and he described the murderer as an artist of the highest kind. He said he was the scourge of God, he was a domestic attiller, you know, he was, he was a serpent, he was, sort of, um, he was a fallen angel, he was a ladies' man, he was a connoisseur of his art. He said, you get murders like this so rarely. You, get, you, you can't expect every day that a brilliant murder is going to turn up on your doorstep. You know, any more than you can expect that a brilliant play is going to be performed or a brilliant poem is going to be written. We have to evaluate murders like we would evaluate poetry. And John Williams was the greatest artist of the age. There's William Wordsworth. He said, De Quincey said, in On Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts, that the murderer had to invent the taste by which he was going to be judged. Now, if any of you remember your preface to the lyrical ballads, you remember that that's exactly what Wordsworth said about himself. You know, that Wordsworth and Coleridge had to invent the taste by which they were going to be judged. And so he made a direct analogy between the murderer and the poet. For De Quincey, Wordsworth was the murderer. Anyone who came, in, anyone who came within Wordsworth's orbit was destroyed by him. The power of his mind was devastating, had a devastating effect on those who knew him. Coleridge had been destroyed by Wordsworth, the poet in him had been destroyed. Wordsworth's sister was destroyed by him, she went mad for the last 25 years of her life. De Quincey was near as damn it, destroyed by Wordsworth. He said the impact of this man on the people he knows, the people who love him, the people who live with him, is absolutely devastating. So the murderer is the poet, and the poet is the murderer. That was De Quincey's, that was De Quincey's twist. Just as, I think De Quincey was right. I think De Quincey was right about the power of, the devastating and destructive power of, of powerful writers and living, living with them particularly. He was also right about the way in which we, um, we luxuriate in murders. He was completely right about what would happen 20, 30 years later in the, in the reception of, of, of of Jack the Ripper, just, just up the road in Wapping. So he anticipated our age, if you like, and we find we are all De Quincian now, and I just want to finish just by saying a couple of things about, um, a couple of ways in which we can see De Quincey 
infiltrate, De Quincey's love of murder infiltrating into our culture, apart from everything that's on the telly every night of the week. Um, Hitchcock read on Murder Considered as one of the fine arts and based his dandy killers on De Quincey's description of the dandy killer. Dostoevsky based the murder in the crime and punishment on De Quincey's description of banging and banging and banging. I always think of De Quincey's murderer when I think of those wonderful lines in Nabokov, who was, Nabokov was crazy about De Quincey, when he says at the beginning of Lolita, you can always trust a murderer to have a fancy prose style. <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs>